the vast waters of the inland sea that is Lake Michigan. This lake and the others of the Great Lakes chain has been home to this ship for what is approaching a century of service. This unheard of longevity is a record for vessels on the Great Lakes and a feat rarely matched by ships worldwide. This freighter, traveling upbound from Alpena, Michigan, on Lake Huron, bound for Waukegan, Illinois, is the steamer E.M. Ford. Her cargo on this trip is 7,300 tons of bulk cement. For the past 31 years of this ship's long life, this classic Laker has been in the service of the Huron Cement Company. Her charge during this time has been the transport of cement products produced at the company plant in Alpena to the many Huron cement terminals scattered around the five Great Lakes. At Alpena, the Huron Cement Company quarries limestone and converts it into cement. This process, which uses fires in great kilns to combine the various elements, yields Portland and other special purpose cements. The end of the production line is a battery of silos at water's edge where the six boats in the Huron fleet are loaded. On this day, the EM Ford is being loaded with cement products destined for the construction industry of northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin. Her cargo will eventually become new concrete highways, high-rise cement office and apartment buildings, and cinder block foundations. The Ford is a perfect vessel for duty as a cement carrier. With a length of 428 feet and a beam of 50 feet, this ship is properly proportioned for the tight quarters found at many of the company's terminals. Her draft of 21 foot 6 inches allows the boat to land at shallow harbors, such as the one found at Waukegan, Illinois. When the Ford reaches her destination, her self-unloading equipment will allow her to offload her cargo at the rate of 600 tons per hour. Loading of the ship is accomplished in a minimum of time, usually three to four hours. Great conveyors, loading chutes, and blowers fill the holes to the proper level for correct displacement for lake travel. After checking all compartments and with loading complete, the holes are buttoned up. The ship's 1,500 horsepower quadruple expansion steam engine will give the Ford a cruising speed of 11 miles an hour. With good weather conditions, the ship will make her destination at Waukegan in 40 hours. With steam raised in her two scotch boilers, the Ford is ready for her voyage. The early fall skies are fair and the seas are calm as this 400 mile passage begins. weather of the first day of what will become a 48-hour trip affords ample opportunity for clear sailing, pleasant views, and deck maintenance. The skipper of the EM Ford is Ron Akins. Sailing on the Great Lakes is a, an exceptional experience. Uh, I first started sailing in 1952. I put two years in the North Atlantic on a Coast Guard cutter. Uh, on a weather ship up in the North Atlantic, and the seas were tremendous up there, but the difference in the types of vessels, these, these ships on the lakes could not possibly take the, the ocean seas, whereas uh, the ocean vessels, they encounter a lot of problems with their short, choppy seas up here. Great Lake skies gather the weather systems that brew over Hudson's Bay and the Great Plains to the west. Storms can blow up quickly and can be severe. Fall weather can be particularly dangerous. Radar, wind socks, and weather reports are monitored carefully at all times on the Great Lakes. Particular attention is paid in the fall. The great five-day storm in November of 1913 destroyed or stranded 39 ships with the loss of 248 seamen. Green W89719, the Steamer Unit of Ford calling Waukegan Marine on 84. Is that correct, sir? 
Uh, yeah, you can make a collect. Okay, what was the name you bought? Steamer EM Ford. As the weather of this passage deteriorates, Captain Aikens radios ahead for assessment of sea conditions at Waukegan. Okay, would you check and see what we got for sea down there and possibly, uh, if it looks too bad, you can uh, get back to me? Yeah, I can go down early and uh, check it out. Uh, of course, the, the sea that's in the slip is not the sea that's out there on the lake, but, uh, yeah, I can check it out. Yeah, well, possibly you can see if you come over that far wall there pretty bad. I don't know if I'll be able to jump in there. Okay, uh, how soon are you going to be here? I should be up to the wall in two hours, or a little bit less. All right, fine. I'll get down there just as quick as I can, then. Uh, I haven't even changed my clocks back here yet. I don't even know what time it is here yet. Is that right, eh? Can you figure about two hours from now, though? Yeah, that's right, about two hours. This October passage of the EM-4 precedes by only a few weeks the anniversary of November 10th, 1974. On that day, the ore carrier Edmund Fitzgerald was battered, broken, and sunk by a fierce fall storm. The Fitzgerald went down 17 miles short of Whitefish Bay on Lake Superior with the loss of all 29 sailors on board. The EM Ford is no stranger to the dangers of Great Lakes storms. On Christmas Eve 1979, while most of her complement was ashore visiting families, a sudden storm blew into Milwaukee where she was tied up. During the storm, the fully loaded steamer parted her mooring lines. High winds and heavy seas drove her into the seawall, puncturing her hull. The remaining crew fought gallantly for 24 hours to save the ship. However, the elements proved too much. The ship's compartments filled with water, and the Ford settled to the bottom. This accident interrupted one of the longest histories of continuous sailing by any vessel on the Great Lakes. The Ford is a vestige of a former era, both of American history and of steamship sailing tradition. She was built in Lorain, Ohio as the Press Keel. She was launched at a time of our history that seems very distant to us now. The press keel slid down her ways only three weeks after Admiral Dewey delivered his crushing defeat to the Spanish at Manila during the Spanish-American War. Dewey's flagship, the Olympia, survives today as a museum. Out of commission for almost half a century, the Olympia rests at her permanent berth in Philadelphia. By contrast, the EM Ford is still in service, carrying out her original duties. She's been in continuous operation with the Huron Cement Company, uh, with the exception of two years when she sunk at her dock in Milwaukee and was subsequently raised and almost rebuilt. The original engine is still in this vessel that was built in 1897. It was made into a cement carrier in 1956 and as uh, the first boat I was ever a skipper on, I, I went skipper on her in uh, 1974. Experienced, well-seasoned crews exist in the engine room as well as on the bridge. Engineering crews consist of watch engineer, oiler, and wiper. During his four-hour watch, the oiler is constantly attentive to the engine's needs. This is a quad engine here. And it's a good running engine. The engine was built in 1897. It was built in Cleveland, Ohio. It's number 93. And for an engine being that age, it runs perfect. And it's the only one left on the lakes that I actually know of. Well, my name is Royal McClinic. They call me Bones for short. I've been sailing since 1946. I started with American steamship, U.S. Gypsum. Then I came over to the Huron fleet. I was on the John W. Boardman. I was on the Eichelhardt. I was on the Paul H. Townsend, J.B. Ford. And then I came on the E.M. Ford. 
and I was hand firing it when it was coal burner. And we pulled two fires a watch, and she burned around a ton and a quarter to a ton and a half an hour of coal. And you had to shovel it. The fireman, he took care of the fires, he shoveled the coal in, the boilers. And then uh, when he first went down and relieved the watch, why well, he had to pull two fires. He had a big hole. You opened your boiler door and then you pulled the fire out. You had a big slice bar, you wung the fire over and then you fired to one side. And then you pulled the, all the clinkers and everything out of the other side, see. Then you wung, the, wung your fire back over and you done the same thing with the other side. It was a tough job. Coal firing can still be seen on the Huron fleet in the boiler room of the ST Crapo. The coal passer, he took care of shooting the ashes in it. And as you pulled the fire out of your boiler, the coal passer would stand there with water, and he'd throw water on it to put out the flames in it. The plant of the EM Ford is a contrast of technologies. Modern burner control equipment runs side by side with the men and machines of a former era. The main engine is a magnificent holdover from the age when steam power was the only means of propelling a ship other than sail or muscle. This engine is today unique in that it is the only remaining quadruple expansion engine on the Great Lakes. In the day of its manufacture, it was unique in that it combined the relatively rare joy valve movement of its high first and second intermediate cylinders with the more traditional Stevenson valve movement of its low pressure cylinder. The sliding blocks in the lengths of the joy valve movement derive their motion from radius rods connected to the connecting rods. As the cranks fly around, the side-to-side -side movement of the radius rod is converted to the up-and-down movement needed by the valve. Up-and-down valve motion for the low-pressure cylinder comes from the two eccentrics mounted on the stern end of the crankshaft. Valve reversing is accomplished by rotating the joy valve links in which the blocks slide. Simultaneous shifting of the Stevenson link selects the opposite eccentric so that the valves for all four cylinders shift direction in unison. The reversing lever of the quadrant in the upper engine room is connected through a system of rods and levers to the power reverse steam ram located on one of the intermediate pressure cylinder columns in the lower engine room. The eccentrics for the low pressure cylinder deliver their motion to the valve through the two eccentric rods and the double bar Stevenson link. The four crossheads are of the single slipper design. This arrangement affords ample room for the oiler to make his rounds and for repair and overhaul. Valve stem guides on all four cylinders provide stability for the valve rods and reduce wear on the stuffing boxes. Steam tight packing glands on the four piston rods keep the engine from losing power and ensure more efficient running. The top of the engine reveals the arrangement of high, first intermediate, second intermediate, and low pressure cylinders. Also seen are the three side mounted piston valves and the end-mounted slide valve. Mechanical motion for these valves originates at the links, blocks, and eccentrics, two decks below. The oiler begins his rounds by draining the water from the bottom of the main engine's oil sump. This used oil is run through a centrifugal purifier and pumped to a gravity feed tank for eventual reuse. The upper engine room, I oil uh, the links and uh, the piston rods. And then I go in and I feel my cross heads and give them a shot of oil. Make sure that they're not hot or there's no heat there. 
And then I go down below and then I feel my uh, eccentrics and my thrust bearing. And then I proceed on to my cranks and journals to make sure there's no heat and make sure that they're getting oil. Then you check your your tail pump and you oil your little pumps you got running in that. and you check see all your burners is so there isn't any oil spill or anything leaking. The boilers have been fully automated now to oil burner. They figure it was cheaper to burn oil than it was coal. During this trip, fuel oil has been giving the engine room crews a problem. The chief engineer describes a strange red color in the oil itself. As the fuel burns, other colors cause problems. The ultraviolet sensors in the automatic burners are having trouble getting a fix on the exact flame characteristics. As a result, some of the burners keep shutting down. With only four furnaces, such a problem can cause a sudden loss of steam pressure and threaten to slow the ship. The solution was to defeat the automatic system and run the burners manually. Only after doing this was the engine room crew able to maintain the steam pressure and keep up speed. The engine is oiled both internally and externally. Internal moving parts, such as pistons and valves, are kept lubricated by a sparing amount of superheat valve oil, which is mixed with the steam. This thick, dark oil is pumped into the high-pressure valve chest by a single Manzel mechanical lubricator. Oil for the external parts is gravity-fed from a day tank through sight glasses into the many oil lines which, like blood vessels, carry their life-sustaining fluid to the engine's many extremities. These lines connect directly to cranks and journals. Mechanically more complicated parts, such as radius rods and sliding valve blocks, catch dripping oil in horsehair-filled cups. Without this life-sustaining oil, the engine's many bearing surfaces would overheat, score, and eventually seize. A tour of the gauge board reveals the 200 pound steam pressure of the ship's port boiler. Vacuum in the condenser. Receiver pressures for the three cylinders behind the high pressure cylinder. The revolution counter. Starboard boiler pressure of 200 pounds. The builder's name and this board's ultimate charm its age. At this filming, this wonderful machine was 89 years old and still going strong. Careful maintenance and care have kept this engine looking and running as good as it did when new. Auxiliaries include numerous duplex pumps whose services range from fuel oil delivery and boiler feed water to general service and ballast pumping. The thrust bearing is of the color and horseshoe design. With the engines being as far aft as is typical on most Lakers, the thrust bearing is only a short distance from the stern tube. So you can watch that engine going around, you can see what she's doing. And uh, you feel it, make sure she don't get hot or anything on you. You can watch your oil going down, your drops. Not, and, uh, like I say, steam is my main main job. Rather than be on a diesel or, or a turbine, I pre much prefer the steam. 
I was on a Skinner engine that was almost like these uh, up and down jobs. The only thing there why the oil, the engine oiled itself. You didn't have to use any uh, squirt can or nothing on it. It had a pump built into it, pumped its own oil. You get to work with the steam, you, then at the end of the year you got to tear them all down. Tear them all apart, you can see your valves and everything in it. And you clean everything up and then uh, you put them back together. And you paint them all up with heavy lube oil so they don't rust or anything during the winter. And then you come back the next year and then you start them up again. And it's still a thrill to see them going around and that, the way they run. When you give them a shot of steam and she starts up. Well, to me, that's the best I can explain it. I've been sailing with this fleet for 30 years now. I enjoy my work. It's something I've always wanted to do, and I uh, really think that uh, sailing is is a great life. It has its drawbacks uh, when you're raising a family, but other than that, it's, uh, it's a good, clean life. We have a lot of friends out here. You get to know all the other skippers on the lakes. Inbound Waukegan in 10 minutes. Beauty Security Call the Steamer EM4. Inbound Waukegan in 10 minutes. 9719 EM4. 389 is Doug William Sully to the EM4. Uh, EM4, William Sully. Uh, Captain, I hate to do this, but I gotta ask you to slow her up a little bit there. I got uh, two barges laying in your slip here. I just got the word you were coming in and, uh, you know, I had practically no notice. I'm getting one out now, but I still got two to move. Uh, a little bit, I need about another 30 minutes here, Alan. Well, it'll take me almost that much if I go slow going in there, so go ahead. You know, I'll take the floor back. I got as slow as I can get it. Uh, do we rise up to the EM4? Uh, EM4. Yeah, if I pass you on your left, I'm uh, right outside just doing a circle behind you. Sure, come in. Hold steady right here. With the threatening weather of the lakes behind her, the EM Ford makes her way into Waukegan Harbor. The trim dimensions of the Ford pay off in the narrow, crowded harbor. About 36 to go ahead. Good. Unloading at the company silo will take the better part of a day. She'll then turn around and head for home, and as many more loads of cement that the approaching Great Lakes winter will allow. Ice will close the lakes for the winter. When the Ford comes out again next season, only one short decade will remain until she enters her second century of service on the Great Lakes. Okay, fine. We got her all tied up. Good job, Artie. Well, I've been on uh, new ones. I've been on uh, automated jobs for bowling. I sailed the H. Lee White, and, uh, but I prefer steam. Steam is a lot better. Your modern boats are noisy with your diesels running. And I'd. Uh, I prefer steam, because I've been with it most all my life. The ice-free waters of spring will welcome this faithful old lady of the lakes for the 90th time.
These waters will see her travel from her home at Alpena to Muskegon, Milwaukee, Detroit, Green Bay, and the many other ports of call for the Huron fleet. With the same care and maintenance that she has received during her first hundred years, there is no reason the EM Ford won't last well into the 21st century.